afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, the funding process, first steps to applying, how to prepare now, and other considerations, hosted by the Bureau of Justice Assistance. At this time, I'd like to introduce one of today's presenters, Elizabeth Wolf, Senior Policy Advisor with the Bureau of Justice Assistance, for some welcoming remarks. Elizabeth? Thank you, Daryl. I very much appreciate it. Um, my name is Elizabeth Wolf, and I am a Senior Policy Advisor with the Bureau of Justice Assistance, and I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar entitled, The Federal Funding Process, The First Steps in Supplying, How to Prepare Now, and Other Considerations. On behalf of BJA, Greg Turin and I are delighted to be here with you today. We are also sharing the stage with Lisa Hartman from OJP's Just Grants team. Next slide, please. For today's webinar, we'll be providing an overview of the Office of Justice Programs and the Bureau of Justice Assistance. I'll be introducing you to the Just Grants system, providing an overview on how to approach a BJA solicitation. We'll be discussing key steps in completing your application, including going over the peer review process and answering all of your questions. This webinar is designed for those who are interested in applying for BJ funding. Our objective today is to help you be as prepared as possible to do exactly that. So what are we gonna do? We will provide you with the information you need to successfully submit an application in both grants.gov and Just Grants. We will go over the critical elements of a BJ solicitation. We'll share tips for developing a budget and we're gonna explain how the peer review process works. And lastly, we're gonna show you how you can stay connected with all the latest information regarding BJ funding and resources. So what is the Office of Justice Program? Well, OJP provides a variety of resources to the criminal justice community. And how do we do that? We do it through our grants, our training, and our research. And we are one of three grant-making components within the U.S. Department of Justice. The other two offices are the Office of Violence Against Women and the Office of Community-Oriented Policing Services, also known as COPS. Within OJP, there are three distinct bureaus and offices, and you can see that BJA is one of these um, six. There's the Bureau of Justice Statistics, which is the primary statistical agency of the Department of Justice. There's also the National Institute of Justice, which is our research development and evaluation agency within the Department of Justice. There's the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, which supports states and local communities in their efforts to implement effective programs for children. There's the Office for Sex Offender Sentencing, Monitoring, Apprehending, Registering, and Tracking, also known as SMART, which provides jurisdictions with guidance regarding the implementation of the Adam Walsh Act. And finally, there's the Office of Victims of Crime, which also supports a broad array of programs and services that really focus on helping victims. Let me talk a little bit more about BJA. Our office provides leadership and services in grant administration and criminal justice policy development to support local, state, and tribal law enforcement in achieving safer communities. And how do we do that? Well, our office supports programs in a number of areas, including information sharing, countering terrorism, managing offenders, combating drug crime and abuse, advancing tribal justice, crime prevention, protecting vulnerable populations, and capacity building. To learn more about BJA, you can visit our website and follow us on Facebook or Twitter. There are six stages in the life cycle of a grant, and it's good to be familiar with all of them. Um, this webinar is only gonna be focusing on the first three phases of the grant life cycle. And those three are the administrative preparedness, you know, getting yourself really ready to submit an application. And once the solicitation is posted, there's the application period begins, and then you're gonna be locating opportunities, developing proposals, and submitting. And lastly, there's the, the application review process, which is understanding BJ and OJP's internal review process. The next three phases will not be covered in this webinar, but with that said, I'd like you just to know about them and you can learn more about these phases on our website. Um, after you've submitted, and if you are successful, there's the award notification um, process, which is when awards are generally made by September 30th. Not always, but we really, really try to get it done by the end of the fiscal year. And for applications that have been not selected, you will be notified by November 30th. Um, once you've been awarded, we call that the post-award phase, and congratulations, you've got the money and your project is all set, and you will begin working with your program manager and administer your project. And the last phase is the closeout phase. 
um, which is, you know, all good things have to come to an end, and this is also true for grants. The closeout phase is wrapping up deliverables and submitting your report. A little over a year ago, the Office of Justice Programs launched the Just Grants system to replace the old grants management system, also known as GMS. Um, I really want to emphasize this point with you all that you will need to use the Just Grants system and grants.gov to apply for all BJA grants. GMS is no longer available. And the goal of Just Grants is really um, an improved user experience. It's much more streamlined from the moment you receive your award all the way through closeout. The system allows you to manage users better and also integrates a payment system, which helps make it easier for you to access your funds. And I am not an expert on Just Grants. And because of that, I invited Lisa Hartman from the Just Grants team to walk you through the system and kind of help answer some of your questions. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Lisa. Thanks so much, Elizabeth. That was a, a terrific run up to, uh, to Just Grants. So good afternoon or good morning, depending on your location. Uh, thank you for joining our presentation uh, today. Um, as Elizabeth said, my name is Lisa Hartman. I'm a training specialist with the um, Office of um, uh, Audit <laughs> audit management, and um, I'm going to talk to you today about the first steps of applying and how to prepare and other considerations during the funding process. So um, to kick us off, I'd like to share a little bit of information about today's session. Um, as uh, mentioned before, everyone is muted and video has been disabled, and that way we have more resources to provide um, our information to you today. We'll hold all questions on Just Grants until the end of the presentation for Just Grants. Uh, there will be a further opportunity to ask questions about the, um, the presentation from a BJA standpoint later. But as questions occur to you, you can place them in the Q&A section um, as described earlier in WebEx. Um, if you don't see the Q&A option on your WebEx screen, um, as mentioned, open the three dots in the lower right corner of the screen and select Q&A. Uh, select everyone when you're, or all, I'm sorry, all panelists when you're asking a question. Now, our agenda today covers several topics related to the funding process. Uh, the first thing we're going to talk about is entity onboarding, application submission, and award acceptance. So once we've covered the content, we're going to show you where you can go to find additional training resources. So first, we'll talk a little bit about onboarding um, your entities in Just Grants. Um, this is a process that will take place uh, prior to submitting your application in Just Grants. Now, this is a roadmap for Just Grants that kind of helps you visualize each of the steps that are needed um, when a new user is onboarded. So, there will be a single entity administrator for your Just Grants account. Um, this person will um, automatically be assigned the role entity administrator based on their role as the SAM.gov eBiz point of contact. So, SAM.gov. Um, Grants.gov and Just Grants are all linked in such a way that when you uh, submit an application, um, then we're able to, uh, again, assign that entity administrator role based on the SAM.gov eBiz point of contact. That person is going to be the first sort of uh, user in the system, and they're going to log into um, a system called Diamond, which um, allows them to set up all new users. So, um, the, uh, when they set up a new user, the only information required is a first name, last name, and email address. The email address is going to become that person's uh, username when they log into Just Grants. And then that user will also select their own password during the registration process. Now, once a new user is created, the entity administrator is going to assign one or more roles to that user, depending on the general work that user intends to do in Just Grants. And I'll talk about those roles in a minute. New users, uh, once the uh, roles have been assigned, will receive a registration email from the, uh, from the Diamond system once they've been invited to register by the entity administrator. The user will need to open a link in the email and follow the steps to register in Just Grants, including setting up the password as mentioned before and setting up multi-factor authentication. So if you're unfamiliar with that term, multi-factor authentication means that Every time you log into Just Grants, you'll put in your username and password, and then you'll be expected to put in additional code. Often it comes through your, you know, text on your phone. You could also set it up to go to email or voicemail. 
um, and that's entirely up to you how you want to receive that code. So you enter that code in order to log into Just Grants. Now the registration process is step one. Step two is to actually log into Just Grants. So even though a new user has registered and set up their password and their multi-factor authentication, they're not going to be recognized as active users in Just Grants until they've logged into the system at least would, uh, sorry, at least once. So this is a good time to test that username and password. Once the new user is registered and has logged in, then the entity administrator is going to be able to assign that user to specific awards or applications. So we, I promise we talk a little bit about roles, and let's do that now. So for every entity or organization, there are six possible roles to assign. Um, these roles can be assigned one to six different people, or any individual can hold all six roles, if that's the way your organization works. Um, the bottom line is that each user should be assigned as many roles as they're going to need to do the, the work that they intend to do in Just Grants. So the roles determine your access to Just Grants. Um, now we've talked briefly about that entity administrator role and what their basic tasks are. Now in addition to managing users and keeping that, uh, the entity profile information current, they also have read-only access to everything in the system, to all the applications and awards and Just Grants. They really have a sort of a bird's eye view of the entire system. Now, if that entity administration will also need to take part in managing awards or applications, then they're going to need to be assigned the additional roles that allow them to do so. The role of grant award administrator um, is generally assigned to someone who's going to be handling programmatic requirements, including submitting performance reports, initiating and submitting uh, grant award modifications or GAMs, and initiating the award closeout. Uh, we also have a role um, called the alternate grant award administrator. However, currently that role is really limited to initiating, but not even submitting grant award modifications at this time. So there might be some future plans for that role, but currently it's pretty limited. Uh, the application submitter is the person we'll be talking about a lot today. This is the only role that can enter data into an application certify it, and submit it on behalf of your entity. Another important person in the application uh, process is the authorized representative. This is the only person that may accept or decline an award on behalf of the entity. This rule must be assigned to someone in your organization with a legal authority to enter into a binding agreement with the Department of Justice and is legally authorized by your organization to agree to the award terms and conditions. Uh, the authorized representative does not really have a role in the application process. However, they must be designated within the application, so they must be onboarded at that point. Uh, finally, we have a financial manager, and this person will submit the federal financial reports on behalf of the organization. So um, all of that uh, context behind us, let's take a look at the application submission process. So the process of submitting an application in Just Grants actually begins in Grants.gov. Um, and you'll need to go to Grants.gov to locate the funding opportunity with DOJ. Um, when you find one and begin the application process in Grants.gov, you'll submit um, a form SF-424. Um, this is a standard form um, and um, is not, uh, not extensive. Um, if you are applying for funding um, from the COPS office, you know, and Elizabeth mentioned the COPS office, they also have a supplemental to the SF-424 called the SF-424B, but that doesn't really apply um, currently to the BJA uh, awards. You will also have to fill out an SFLLL um, in grants.gov. And really that's the extent of the information that you'll need to uh, submit in grants.gov in order to begin the application process. So aside from those two forms, the SF-424 and the SFLLL in Grants.gov, most of your application is going to be entered in Just Grants. Now your entity information in Just Grants is populated based on entries made in SAM.gov and used in Grants.gov. So we're talking about three systems here. Your entity needs to have a pro, you know, sort of entity information registered in SAM.gov. And, um, and then when you apply in grants.gov, 
you're accessing that information from SAM.gov, and then when you submit your application in Grants.gov to Just Grants, all of that SAM.gov information flows through. Now, it's important to know, because you're going to be applying for part of, doing part of the application in Grants.gov and the bulk of it in Just Grants, you actually have two application submission deadlines. So it's really important to uh, pay attention to these. Um, typically, uh, the grants.gov deadline um, is going to be at least two weeks earlier than the just grants deadline. So um, again, once you click that uh, submit button in grants.gov, you'll have still a couple of weeks in order to finish the application in just grants. And then from just grants, you'll submit it for review at DOJ. Uh, so some of the ways that, that Just Grants streamlines this process is that you're provided with the ability to use a web-based budget detail worksheet. So not only is this process more efficient, but it also establishes a shared structure and a narrative for all of DOJ. So previously, um, you were, uh, grantees were uploading a budget, or applicants would upload a budget um, as sort of an Excel spreadsheet. Now in Just Grants, um, you, you have the opportunity to use this web-based budget detail worksheet, which will then carry your budget figures all the way through the application process, and if you are um, awarded, will carry your budget in, uh, in the, uh, to the, into the funded award. So uh, there's no you sort of double entry of uh, information there. Also, streamline validation of your budgets, allow the process of clearing new budgets to be much faster. Now, your organization also, specifically your assigned entity administrator, has more control over users and award assignments and doesn't require intervention from DOJ in order to make updates to those assignments. So your entity administrator can add new users, um, add new roles. They can do all of these things that, uh, that previously required um, intervention from DOJ. Uh, now that's uh, no longer the case. The entity administrator, again, defaults to your organization's SAM.gov, EBIS point of contact. However, if that's not the person who's going to perform the entity administrator role in Just Grants, those responsibilities can be assigned to another user as needed. Now, the next role we want to talk about is the application submitter. The um, person with this role is going to be the only person in Just Grants that's going to be able to submit an application. This role is automatically created when the application is submitted in Grants.gov. The person submitting the information in grants.gov is automatically assigned to the application in Just Grants. If the person um, who's automatically assigned is not going to be the person that's going to complete this, uh, the, the uh, bulk of the application in Just Grants, uh, it's easy enough. The entity administrator can reassign this role as needed. Uh, the application submitter um, is going to identify the forms that are needed to submit an application, will complete the web-based budget form, complete and certify the application on behalf of your entity, and we'll submit the application in Just Grants to the Department of Justice for review. Now, if a member is assigned only the application submitter role, they're only going to be see, able to see applications. They will not be able to see funded awards. All other roles will be able to see funded awards in Just Grants. Now, again, it's possible to assign multiple roles to the user with the application submitter if you want that person to ultimately be able to um, access and manage awards. So now I'm going to show you two short demos. Uh, the first one is a demonstration on locating an application in Just Grants. The second one is a little longer, but it's going to cover all of the basic application sections you'll see when you're completing and submitting an application in Just Grants. So it's important to remind you that by the time you see this application in Just Grants, you will have already um, uh, opened grants.gov, found your funding opportunity, um, logged in uh, using, you know, you logged into grants.gov to access your SAM.gov information, and you'll have filled out those two forms, SF424 and SFLLL. At that point, you can submit the application from grants.gov, and within about 24 hours, that will appear here in Just Grants. It actually can take a couple of days for that transfer to take place because grants.gov will do some validations on your submitted application from that system before it sends um, your information to Just Grants. So I'm gonna go ahead and start this little demo. 
Now from the home page in Just Grants, you're going to see the My Work List. You can see that there in the middle of the bottom. Now this is a list of all the tasks that are assigned directly to you, and I'm logged in as an application submitter. You can use the uh, headers in the work list to sort and filter. And what you're looking for is actually the grant package. Um, the grant package is what we call an application prior to it being um, accepted. The case ID is always going to start with A for application. Now, if you're not the application submitter, you can still see applications in here, but you go to the applications menu on the left. And this shows um, all of the uh, applications that are in uh, your organization, regardless of who it's assigned to. Notice that we have some that are assigned and some that are not assigned to uh, application submitters and authorized representatives. We can go ahead and open these up. And one of the things that uh, is important to understand, and, and because this is kind of an important point, I want to stop the demo for a moment and, and talk about this a bit. Now, if you open an application from your um, the My Work List on your home page, um, all of the work in the My Work List is assigned to you personally. So Just Grants understands that, and it will allow you to just go ahead and open up an application and begin to work in it. When you open an application from the Applications menu like we're doing now, uh, because all users can see these applications, Just Grants is going to need to verify that, yes, you are indeed the single individual that can actually open this application. And to do that, it's going to require that you uh, select this Begin button in the upper right corner. That's the, sort of the validation that you are the correct application uh, submitter. So I'm going to let this move forward. We'll select that Begin button, and um, then we'll see the application open and be ready for editing. Now, had you opened this from your work list, it would look like this automatically. At the bottom, there's a save button, so you can, uh, and you need to click save. It's not going to auto save anything. Um, the cancel button um, will allow you to um, cancel and return uh, back to the work list with, without saving any changes whatsoever. And the continue button will take you to the next page. And uh, just uh, briefly to talk about the next page and what is that, uh, in the upper right corner of the um, application, you see a sort of a menu. And when you click continue, um, Just Grants will follow that menu option linearly right down the page. Um, if you, however, want to, for instance, jump to the proposal narrative, you can do that by just clicking that proposal narrative option there on the menu to the right. Um, it's also worth noting that above that menu, you see a link to solicitation instructions. That's a critical link because uh, you want to have the solicitation handy because you will find a lot of direction uh, within the solicitation as to the specific information that's required in the application. So uh, when you click that solicitation instructions link, it's going to open the solicitation in PDF format and allow you to print it, keep it on a separate monitor, minimize it and refer to it. But at any rate, that solicitation is a terrific option to have. Um, now I'd like to go through um, the, uh, the next few steps, which is, um, again, locating the application. We're going to open it from the work list. And then we're going to go through the process of going through all the sections of the application so that you can kind of get a sense of how this uh, works. Um, so uh, here we are on the um, home page. And if you remember from the work list, if we click the uh, grant package or the application, as you see down there at the bottom, um, then we'll open straight up into um, a manner that we can actually edit that application directly. So we're going to uh, open this up. Notice there's no begin button from the from the uh, home page, the work list. Now this first section um, is the standard applicant information. The funding opportunity information comes from grants.gov, um, as does the project information. So everything you fill out in grants.gov is going to come over here to Just Grants. You will not have to duplicate your entries. Um, <clears throat> there's a, a section here at the bottom. Um, and notice that the project information is editable. So if you um, put in sort of uh, preliminary um, uh, dollar amounts, for instance, if you put in a preliminary amount for federal estimated funding, you can in Just Grants update it. So if you have a better sense now of your budget and your needs, um, it doesn't matter that you've submitted a different figure in uh, grants.gov. You can update these figures in Just Grants. 
and it, you don't have to go back to grants.gov and make them equal. It's, uh, you know, once it moves from grants.gov to just grants, this is where the, the uh, information uh, now lives. Um, all right, so below um, all of that project information, there's an area called areas affected by project. And um, we're going to click the little add button here, I think, uh, momentarily. And that will allow us to um, add uh, areas affected by the project. Now, in the application process, you want to come as close as you can uh, to, to determining the areas affected by project. And you can put in cities, counties, states, parishes. Um, you can put in uh, zip codes. If it's a, you know, fairly limited, you can add 10 items here. So if this is going to be a statewide, you can say state and uh, type in a state, um, or there's just a zip code right there as well. And again, we can click add. You can have a combination of uh, zip codes or other entries there. So that is a required field. And you'll note at the end of that um, field name, a little red asterisk, that that's the indicator that this is a required field. Um, now, as we scroll down this page, you can see the application type. And you can see the application submitter information. Now, this is the application type um, is uh, editable, but the application submitter is not. In order to change that application submitter per, uh, information, the entity administrator is going to have to reassign this application to someone else. Um, so we have some eligibility options, and then we also have uh, our type of app applicant options. Um, again, drop down menus, um, you can select multiple. And then we have the executive order and delinquent debt um, section. So uh, here we are. Now we're going to, I'm just going to go ahead and click the menu link for the next page. I could have clicked continue as well. Now, this is where the authorized representative becomes important in the uh, application process. So when you select um, the application, the authorized representative, you're going to select from a list of um, users in your system that have been assigned the role authorized representative and have registered and logged in. So until you log in as the authorized representative, the name is not going to appear on this list. And we get this question a lot. You know, I, they registered, but I can't find them in the system. They have to log in. Once you've selected the, authorization, uh, the authorized representative from the list, you want to click Confirm Authorized Representative. And when you do that, you'll see that the name um, and title appears here. So this is how we determine uh, the authorized representative. Now I'm going to go back briefly. And I just want to note that this is sort of a generic um, demo that we do. It's not specific to BJA. Um, this particular demo um, is for an office in which um, they actually require two authorized representatives. In BJA, you will only um, ever see one. So once you've confirmed that authorized representative, then we're going to go ahead and move to the next section, which is um, verify legal name and address. All right. I went back a little bit, so we're going to have to wait. Um, so the verify legal name and address um, is, uh, again, this information comes from SAM.gov. So if you happen to notice an error or discrepancy here, then you'll want to um, have your EBIS point of contact go back to SAM.gov and uh, update that information. Once it's updated in SAM.gov, it typically takes about 24 hours for that change to be visible in Just Grant, so it's not an immediate change. The proposal abstract is uh, just a big text field. Notice the um, required asterisk there. This text can be typed directly into the text field below or it can be copied and pasted. Now, it should be noted that if you're copying and pasting from uh, Microsoft Word, uh, Microsoft Word kind of has its own formatting and it can be a little problematic. So if you, um, if you notice, going back a bit, um, there, is a, um, there is a font um, uh, and a formatting you know, options here that you can use to clean up your, um, your proposal abstract as needed. After the proposal abstract, we have the proposal narrative, and this is typically an upload. Um, there's also a, 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 an option for goals and objectives. So if you click new goal, it allows you to enter a goal statement. Again, can be copied and pasted. And notice that there, uh, there's a character limit that's listed below this uh, field. Um, if you want to delete one, you use the little trash can icon. Now, in the budget and um, associated documentation, again, this is a generic demo, and some of these budget categories do not apply to BJA. 
Um, but the, the, the general sense of how this information is entered is really kind of what we're looking for here. Um, so this is a sort of a personnel position. Um, you can enter the position and the salary and all of that sort of thing. You can open the uh, travel um, section. And um, before we move forward, I'm going to um, show you, uh, I guess we'll move forward here. Um, at the, let's see. Okay, so um, for most of these uh, uh, budget categories, um, you can add uh, information line item by line item. So you click this plus add item at the top of the page to add a line item, and then it will provide you the opportunity to um, enter your uh, budget figures. You can continue to add as many line items as you need. If you want to delete one, there's a delete line item. You just have to click into any field in the line and click the delete line item and it will remove it. Now, all of these budget categories also have additional narrative fields. They're not required, but it's encouraged um, for you to provide any additional information about this budget category uh, that you feel will be um, helpful in, um, you know, in, in the review process here at DOJ. All right, we're going to continue on looking at some of these budget uh, categories. Um, oh, here's, we're going to actually click the line item. So we've got uh, that option. You can you know, add or delete. Um, notice the green check marks here. Uh, the check marks, by the way, indicate that you've opened this category. It does not indicate um, that you have completed this category. So that's, a, that's kind of an important point. It just means that somebody's looked at it, but it does not mean that you've entered all the required fields and that you're ready to submit that, um, that section. Oops. Let's see, move forward here. Let's see a little farther along. All right, so um, moving forward uh, a little bit farther, um, you've got some indirect cost items here. And then at the end of the budget, we have a budget summary. And um, the budget summary here uh, will show at the top all of the um, individual budget categories, and it will show the total uh, cost as you've entered it. So total cost of that budget category. So if you're tracking it against the spreadsheet, um, then you're going to be able to compare and make sure that you've entered everything uh, correctly. Um, after the budget summary, we have a section where you can add budget and financial documents. And I'd like to take just a moment to talk about uploading files a bit in uh, Just Grants. So when you upload a file, um, and I hope that this demo actually um, it does provide the opportunity to take a look at this, you can drag or drop files or you can select files um, and then attach. Now, once you upload a file, um, you're going to see the file name and you're gonna see a very important field called the file category. Um, Just Grants will, um, will file all of your uh, attachments in the application based on the file category that you select. So for instance, if you select the file category indirect cost rate agreement, then you can see the third item here on the list. That's where it, uh, Just Grants will place that, um, that uh, file. If you select employee comp compensation waiver as the file category, then the fifth item down, that the fifth section down is where you're going to find that attachment. Um, typically, the file category attachment um, uh, will default to other. And if you look here on the right hand side, you'll see that other appears second from the bottom. So if you're missing an attachment, it's, uh, it's uh, 99 times out of 100, it's because uh, you, were, you did not select the file category to place that file where you expect to see it in the application. And the first place that I would go looking for it would be in the other section. And that's a question we get uh, a lot. It's not necessarily um, self-explanatory. Now we have these memoranda of understanding and typically these are uploads. So again, you wanna upload and select the proper file category. We have additional application components. And then we have these disclosure and assurances. And um, for instance, this disclosure of lobbying activities um, would be automatically populated based on your entry in grants.gov of the SFLLL document. That's the document that will automatically appear here. You will not need to do anything uh, with that. Uh, moving forward, we have additional disclosures. Uh, there's one of disclosure of duplication of cost items, and it's just a yes or no selection. 
um, we have additional, um, you know, additional uh, disclosures and all of these uh, longer ones will have a little check mark at the bottom. So going back maybe a little bit, um, what you would do in this particular case is you'd have to scroll all the way to the bottom and there's a little check box that you're going to check and that will put the name of the application submitter, their title and the date and timestamp when that certification was, um, was uh, selected. So moving forward, uh, we have uh, other disclosures and assurances that can be uploaded. And then finally, we have this, um, we have this, um, let me see, I wanted to move forward here. We have the Declaration of Certification to the U.S. Department of Justice as this application submission. And if you see at the bottom here, that little checkbox is what I'm talking about um, from the other disclosures. You'll want to um, check that box and your signer ID and date and time will be entered there. And then you will be uh, the person that will be considered to have certified uh, that. Um, we'll go again to the other section, and this is again a section where you can upload additional documents. And again, if you're missing a file, check that other um, uh, option first. Now on the certify and submit, this is the very last page of the application. And this is a place where you can review all of the previous um, sections. And you can, um, you can open up these little carrots on the left and read, uh, read through, uh, but not edit from here. You have to read through all of the information. If there's a, an, an error and you want to go back and correct it, for instance, it's in the proposal abstract, you'll need to go back to the right-hand um, side over here and go back to that proposal abstract section to make those updates because it will not be um, readable here. Now, at the end of the application, you select the final review and certification of application confirmation, and that is the indicator that you are ready to submit. Um, if there are any missed uh, fields or um, you know, missed um, required fields or checkboxes when you click submit, um, you will uh, get um, at the top of the page um, a, a pink, um, sort of a pink banner that indicates what you may have uh, missed. So if you get any uh, messages in a pink banner, then it will tell you specifically which field and which section to go back and uh, review. Um, so that is um, then the, um, the uh, process of doing uh, an application. Um, now I'm just going to talk a little bit in brief about um, the award acceptance because um, it, uh, I'm not going to do a demonstration of it, um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about award acceptance. So if your application ultimately um, uh, results in funding for your organization, uh, then the authorized representative is going to be the person that will need to accept or decline that award. They're the only, um, the only role that's allowed to accept or decline an award, and they have to be assigned specifically to that award. And again, it must be a person in your organization with the authority to enter into a legal agreement on behalf of the entity and bind it to the award terms and conditions. So this is the person that's designated in the application. Uh, the entity administrator must assign the authorized representative to the award package. And if the authorized representative changes between the time you place their name in the application and the time that you um, are working with a, um, with a funded award, then the entity administrator is going to need to reassign that uh, authorized representative role to the um, award and just grant. All right. Um, and then the last thing, award acceptance um, takeaway is prior to accepting the award, the entity administrator then must assign the financial manager and grant award administrator to the award as well so that there are individuals who can manage the federal financial reports and all the programmatic aspects of the award. Um, so now I'm going to go uh, briefly talk about some resources that we um, have provided uh, that we will provide for you for just grants. Um, <clears throat> first of all, as part of this presentation, uh, we're, we do have links in, uh, in this PowerPoint uh, to all the information we covered today. So the Justice Grants website that I referenced at the top of the screen houses all of the training material that you'll need to work your way through all aspects of Just Grants. We've placed direct links here to um, the entity uh, user uh, training and the application submission training. We've also linked uh, to the Justice Grants User Roles Guide, which provides a little bit more in-depth information about each of those roles. 
Um, now, if you uh, are having uh, issues with Just Grants, you can contact the Just Grants Technical Support Desk uh, by sending an email to justgrants.support at usdoj.gov. Now, this will um, automatically open a ticket for you, and someone will respond and uh, help you work through uh, whatever the issue is. If you want to talk to somebody right away, you can also call 833-872-5175, Monday through Friday, between 5 a.m. and 9 p.m. Eastern, or between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. Eastern time on weekends or holidays. And please do use either the support email or phone line for any of the issues you may have when working in Just Grants. Now, the Just Grants training uh, resources website that I referenced earlier, um, and I would um, suggest that perhaps you uh, note this down, is https colon forward slash forward slash justicegrants.usdoj.gov. Um, on that website, we have um, resources available to help you with application submission um, as far as Just Grants goes. Um, also, information on onboarding, um, you know, users to assist in the application process, uh, as well as the funded award process, again, should um, your application become funded. So, we also have up there job aid reference guides. We have micro learning videos. We have recordings of um, sessions that we hold for training and frequently asked questions. We also have glossary terms. So I highly recommend um, that you jot down this website and take a good long look through it because we have just a huge number of resources. Now, once you open the training link, you're gonna see a list of training topics displayed. Um, <clears throat> and it's a good idea for everyone to start with the Entity User Experience Guide uh, since that covers navigation and just grants, and it really applies to everyone. The entity administrator will also need to become very familiar with the entity management guide. Now, once you've selected the topic to explore, you'll open a page um, with training resources dedicated to that topic. And in the center um, image, you can see the micro learning videos. These are really just YouTube videos that we've embedded in this page that will walk you step by step through um, a particular task. Most of these videos are eight minutes or less, so they're not going to take up a huge amount of time. And you can, you can um, access them and use them whenever you like. We also have access to job aid reference guides, which are sort of printable step-by-step -step guides, um, like the one you see on the right uh, in the image there. We provide screenshots and then steps, and we indicate on the screenshot um, where that step takes place. Um, so, lots of great uh, training information. Again, we also cover the application submission information. Now, we do offer virtual Q&A series every week to all grantees. This is not specific to BJA. Um, this, is, uh, this is open to, uh, to everyone. We hold post-award management sessions on Mondays from 1 to 2. Um, these are sessions for, um, for organizations with funded awards, and we talk about um, federal financial reports, performance reports, grant award modifications, and closeouts. On Tuesdays, we hold sessions from 2 to 3, um, and again, these are all Eastern time for entity administrators. And here we talk about adding uh, new users, removing users, um, and just in general, um, the uh, tasks that are required by entity administrators. On Wednesdays from 2.30 to 4, starting in February, uh, we're going to be conducting an applications mechanics class, which will be um, a 90-minute uh, course, um, again, uh, talking about uh, very much uh, the same information we have today. So um, if you feel like you want more uh, insight into the application process, please uh, feel free to join us uh, here. And then Thursdays, uh, for those uh, organizations that are funded, we have an award acceptance class from 2 to 3. Now, the link at the bottom of the page um, takes us to justicegrants.usdoj.gov forward slash training, forward slash training virtual sessions, and that's where you can go to register for any or all of these classes. There's no limit to the number of classes you can take. So at this point, um, Lenora, I would like to see if maybe we have any questions in the Q&A or the chat that um, apply to Just Grants. Yes, Lisa. Uh, first question for local government units, is there simply one SAM number that is used for the county or should each department have their own SAM number? So that's a really good question. Um, so um, there is, uh, when, you log in, when you register for SAM account, 
Um, you can register for your, uh, your organization. So, for instance, um, if your organization is the city of Alexandria, then currently we're using a DUNS number for that, but we're going to be moving in a couple of months um, to using a unique entity identifier, UEI number. So, the, the city of Alexandria can have their own UEI number, but if you're the sheriff's department or the sheriff's office or the, the, the police force that works for the city of, of Alexandria, you may be eligible for a different type of funding. And so, you may also want to have um, your own UEI and your own um, access to just grant. So, um, you know, so that's uh, really kind of up to your organization how you want to uh, use that in, that information. Okay. Our next question, can an awarded grant be changed from one EBS point of contact to another to more accurately reflect who the grant was awarded to? Absolutely. So, um, and again, if you um, are interested in, um, in how to do that, we, um, I would recommend that perhaps uh, you um, register for our entity administration course, because we'll show you uh, exactly how to do that and explain, you know, explain the process for that. Can you have more than one grant administrator for the same award or project? Not at one time. So, um, you can only have one grant award administrator assigned to an award at a time. However, if two people are going to be doing different things in the award, for instance, if one person is going to be handling um, sort of programmatic uh, project goals and another um, person is going to be handling the performance reports, the entity administrator can reassign that award from one person to another so that they can accomplish the tasks in there. But there can only be one person assigned at a time. So, I'm a contractor working with several different organizations. What role should, would you suggest I obtain with primary BJA clients to use in Just Grants? So, it's not, uh, so you're not going to have a single Just Grants um, username. You're going to have to have a separate Just Grants user role, uh, uh, role assigned for each of those organizations. So, if you're going to be working in separate, you know, several separate Just Grants accounts, you're going to have uh, have to have a separate uh, email address, username, and password, one for each account. There's no way to provide one person access to multiple uh, organizations. So you have to sign up for that organization individually. Um, and the role that you'd be assigned um, would depend on the work that you're going to be doing in each of those organizations. So, for instance, if you are Lisa Hartman one at, you know, email.com for one, um, for one organization and you're going to be a grant award administrator, then in that organization, you should be assigned the role of grant award administrator. But if I sign in as Lisa Hartman 2 at email.com to a different organization and there I'm going to be um, an application submitter, then for that organization, I need to be assigned the application submitter role. So as a contractor working with several organizations, you're going to have to work with the complexity of having um, different, a, a different just grants email address and login for each of those organizations. Okay. Can an agency have two financial managers in the system? Absolutely. Um, multiple people can be assigned as the financial manager, any of the roles actually. The only one that has a single, uh, a single limitation is the entity administrator. There's only one of those. But all of the other five roles, you can have as many people in your organization assigned that role as you need. Now, once, so you can have six financial managers uh, in your organization. Um, however, only one financial manager can be assigned to a particular award. So if you're managing multiple awards in Just Grants, sure, you can have a different financial manager for each award and each of them can have that role. But for each individual award, only one person at a time. It can be reassigned as needed. Okay, Lisa, we have a lot of questions in the Q&A and, &A and uh, it's Almost at the top of the hour, I think we want to move forward okay. with the presentation and come back to the questions if we have time. Yeah, that's fine. Let's do that. Okay, thank you. Um, all okay. right, then I'm going to go ahead and turn the uh, presentation back over to the uh, program office. Thank you so much. Okay, okay. welcome everyone. My name is Gregory Terrain. Can you hear me now, Daryl? Yes, we can. Okay. Hey, welcome everyone. My name is Greg Durant. I am a policy advisor at BJA. Today I'll be covering how to read the solicitation, key steps for completing your application, and understanding the peer review process. Um, 
step one. One of the things you want to make sure that when you're uh, reviewing the solicitation, uh, you want to ensure that your entity or agency is an eligible uh, applicant. Uh, looking over to your right, when you look at the first page of solicitation, it breaks down who is eligible to apply for that solicitation. Um, important thing to note that if you're not an entity that's eligible to apply, doesn't necessarily eliminate you from the grant application process. Um, you can either partner uh, as a subawardee with an eligible entity, whether they're in your state, your county, or jurisdiction, you can partner with them to be a partner within that application, or again, like I mentioned, as a subawardee. Uh, remember that only one entity can be the applicant. Um, so we highly at BJ encourage um, partnerships with an application, but again, only one entity can be the applicant or the fiscal agent. Uh, also step two, ensure that you provide enough time to complete the application. Uh, be aware that just two uh, deadlines, there's the grant.gov deadline as well as the just grants. Um, you definitely want to take into account the time required to register and apply, um, do the prepping, get all the required attachments when you're submitting your application. We know each um, jurisdiction that may be applying have different capacities and staff. You might just have two staff uh, doing the grant writing, or you're, you may be lucky to have uh, five or six people that are working on this application. Um, but definitely give yourself enough time to complete the application. Next slide. Step three, you read all the specific uh, section of program specific information in terms of understanding what can you apply for in terms of requesting funding. So within the solicitation, you'll see like to the side, what are some of the things that you can apply for or use funding for in the solicitation. You definitely wanna read that carefully to make sure that you are um, writing your application, which is reflecting what you can actually um, request funding to support. And then step four, obviously you wanna definitely read the rest of the application in its entirety to make sure you have a good understanding of the application. Next slide. Step five, determine if your agency has a capacity to uh, fill the responsibilities of the solicitation. Uh, one of the things that um, you definitely wanna do is when you're reading through um, the application or the solicitation, uh, if there's potential gaps in, uh, in terms of services that your entity would not be able to support, you definitely wanna bring partners to the table that may be able to address those gaps. So if you're starting or you're implementing or enhancing your drug court program um, and you don't have a treatment provider already as a partner, um, and that will be a component of that solicitation, you definitely wanna reach out to treatment providers to, to address that gap in service. Uh, again, what I'll say, um, making those close partnerships. So what I was saying here is that if there's any gaps in services within um, your applying, you definitely wanna make sure you reach out to partners uh, to support those gaps um, to your application. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Uh, in terms of planning and organizing your writing, uh, you definitely wanna read through your application, um, developing a timeline and a checklist, uh, specifically off the Appendix A, which is the application checklist. Um, what you wanna do is make sure that you provide enough time to go over the steps in terms of registering, uh, developing those letters of, letters of support, and inviting uh, partners in the planning meeting. One of the things I would suggest with this also too is that you wanna prepare as, as early as possible. Um, each year, BJ, we put out solicitations, um, and year to year, there's usually just minor modifications to solicitations. So what you want to do, or would be helpful, if you look at last year's solicitation um, for what you're looking to apply for, and maybe three to four months in advance, develop a, a planning or partner meeting uh, for the grant, identify who's going to be doing what, make sure you have the partners in place. That'll give you a big jump on um, when you're looking to um, submit your application and preparing for um, the funding, but also create that timeline on who's going to do what and when you want to get those things accomplished. Next slide. Step two, you want to review the um, review the criteria section carefully. Make sure you outline um, the application. The biggest mistake we see is applicants not answering all the questions, and you want to make sure when you're responding to it that you're keeping everything in order. Um, this is very important because when you're looking to 
Well, when we're at BJA or we have our peer reviewers reviewing these applications, um, we want to make sure that you're answering every question and those uh, responses are in the order that we're reviewing them. The last thing you want a peer reviewer uh, to be doing is looking for information that's uh, in the application but not where it should be in the application. Next slide. So an example of what that would be um, for what we're saying as uh, developing an outline, I call it putting together the skeleton of the application. So the major questions that are in the statement of the problem or the uh, project design, you want to break those questions down uh, in the solicitation um, separately to make sure you respond to them. So you can highlight them in red, um, go to that question, respond directly to that question, then go to the next question within that paragraph um, highlight it underneath it, respond directly to it um, until you answer all the questions thoroughly. Again, this brings back who your partners may be. So there's a certain question where you might not have the answer or the capacity, then it may be the partners that you bring to the table that are written into the application that will address um, those questions within your application. Um, next slide. So step three, make sure you understand the instructions. So when you look at the solicitation on the right, you'll see in the project narrative, um, the application should be double spaced uh, using standard 12 point time New Roman font. Um, also should not exceed 20 pages. This is a very important, um, not um, doing this may present challenges to your application. Uh, next slide. Step four, draft your budget very early in the process. Uh, make sure you read it carefully and understand the special requirements, such as the required grant meeting. Also, make sure you read carefully and understand what are the caps on expenses, as well as what's not allowable. Uh, again, this is important. Um, so when you're looking at your solicitation and you're looking to apply, if the maximum amount of funding is $500,000 uh, or up to $500,000, you should not look to exceed that $500,000. If you put $500,000 in one, then you exceeded the cap. Also, um, you can go into the, um, the resource you see below, the DOJ Grant Financial Guide, to um, see what is an unallowable expense. Uh, next slide. Okay, the budget and budget narrative. Budget narrative should reflect directly the project design, meaning you should not have any expenses outside of what's referenced uh, in the budget as compared to what's referenced in the proposal narrative. An example is do not ask for drug testing supplies if you do not include drug testing as a component in your project description. This is important because a lot of peer reviewers are when we're reviewing applications. One of the first things we do is go to the budget to see what you're requesting because that's really um, the main piece of your application or what you're going to be indicating and in that and the proposal or the project narrative that you're indicating that you're going to be doing. Also, personnel costs should be related to the key personnel for the project. Sub-recipients sub recipient should be categorized as either sub-risk, sub-awards, or procurement contracts. Uh, the budget should not include adequate, it should include adequate funding to fully implement the project. And again, not more than what you're, not more than what the maximum amount allowable. Uh, the budget narrative should have leave no question to the peer reviewer on what you're requesting. And the total federal requested entered in the SF-424 should match the total federal requested in the application budget for the entire project period. Next slide. Step five, do not forget the required attachments. So in the solicitation, there's a section that indicates additional attachments. As you can see to your right, uh, you see a letter of support, memorandum of understanding. To the right of it says required. Uh, at the bottom under B says project timeline, required. Some of the attachments may say recommended, but if they do indicate they're required, please be sure to check that and make sure you, you include those additional attachments. Next slide. Okay, BMR, basic minimum requirements. Each application or each solicitation should have um, critical elements that, it, that needs to be in the application. An example of those would be the, pro the proposal narrative, a time and task plan, the budget, a detailed worksheet, budget narrative, or an applicant disclosure of proposed subrecipient. This is very critical to the application uh, because if any of these pieces are missing uh, from your application, your ap application gets 
drained out immediately and will not make it to the peer review process. So please make sure when you're um, developing your application that you include these critical elements of the application. Um, these are pretty much the basic ones, but note that some solicitations may have other critical elements um, that are in the solicitation that you need to be aware of. But again, make sure these elements are in that uh, application. Uh, check it once, twice, three times. Uh, next slide. Okay, check the application checklist um, and make sure that you, and that is in the Appendix A. Uh, again, this is just a good guide to make sure that you cover everything that's in that um, in your application submission all the way down to registering with DUNS, you know, DUNS numbers with SAMS. Um, it's very important uh, that you do this. You check it four or five times and have someone else also check the checklist for you to make sure you have all that information in your application. Um, just one side note, what I, I do want to allow people to remember when you're submitting your applications, uh, please remember, we see these every now and then, that we get applications that come in that have, still have comments in them that aren't cleaned up. Uh, so please make sure when you double check all the documents that you double check the actual application um, document to ensure that you know you, you cleaned it up and we're not seeing comments in the application. Uh, next slide. All right, for any unforeseen technical issues, um, you can visit the response center at grant dot a grant at ncjrc.gov. Uh, and for any other technical issues, you can visit the OJP Grant Application Resource Guide uh, at the email, at the um, website link below. Uh, next slide. For other questions uh, that you have about your submission of the solicitation, uh, with policy advisors, we do put together uh, solicitation webinars. Uh, those are recorded and uh, transcripts are kept of that. So please check those. Sometimes we have links within the solicitation that leads you to um, uh, those solicitation webinars. Also review any solicitation FAQs or the program webpage. Um, to identify where to look for that, you can just Google BJA programs. Um, it'll take you to the various links to all of our different programs. And then within those program web pages. Um, you will be able to see our solicitation, if there's any uh, FAQs, as well as any solicitation webinars. Also, you have the contact for grants.gov, as well as uh, just grants, what we, we heard a little bit earlier, as well as the contact for the Resource Center. This information is located on the first three pages of the solicitation. Uh, next slide. Okay, understanding the peer review process. So each application is re um, typically reviewed by three peer reviewers and they score your application based on the criteria, looking at the statement of the problem, the project design, looking at within the capabilities and comparabilities, uh, data collection and the budget section. Uh, important tip, uh, so when you complete your application, each of those components has um, a certain uh, percentage to them. As you can see with this one, you're looking at the statement of problem has 15%. Uh, some of the components uh, way a little higher. So if you have a statement of the problem at 15% and then you have a project design at 30%, uh, percent, you want to make sure that you spend more time on the project design, which heavy, which weighs a little heavier uh, for your application than other sections. Just a tip to make sure that you're aware of that. Uh, next slide. Okay, so I'll be ready to turn this back over to you, Daryl. Yeah, thanks, Gregory. So, a lot of information shared today. Uh, hopefully, it's been of use so far. What we're going to do now is just before we get into the end program with the questions, just go over a couple additional resources that you all can access that can help with your applications. Um, this slide uh, references BJ's website, which is going to be the main repository for things related to BJ, uh, www.bja.ojp.gov. Um, there's a grant re OJP grant applicant resource guide that's available as well. A lot of useful resources that's listed at the URL here. It's going to be posted in the chat as well uh, from our host uh, for you to access directly. Uh, the Office of Justice Programs has an award data section from their site that you can click on. 
And then energyscrimesolutions.gov is a wonderful resource, web-based clearinghouse of programs and practices that have been rated for their effectiveness in addressing different criminal justice issues. So a lot to reference from that site there at crimesolutions.gov. This slide highlights the Department of Justice's program plan for FY 2022. Uh, it's a tool to help applicants and grantees find funding opportunities, otherwise known as solicitations, that address their criminal, juvenile, and civil justice needs. The plan is pretty in depth, very comprehensive, and provides summary details on the funding opportunities that DOJ agencies are expecting to release this year. So that link is going to be entered in your chat as well. Definitely a resource to check out and bookmark. Looking ahead, uh, the OJP Grants and Financial Management and Grant Administration trainings can be located at this website here. And also the OJP Funding Resource Center is a one-stop shop for all things funding related to OJP grants. Um, those will both be posted in the chat as well for you to click on. So wrapping it all up, you know, stay connected to BJA. There's several different ways that are offered up. Uh, one is the text option. You can text OJP uh, with your email address to 468-311 to subscribe. Uh, message data rates may apply. It's a good way to keep up to date. Um, also social media, Facebook's, uh, BJA's Facebook, Twitter, and RSS feeds are available here. And then once again, for just general information on BJ, either their funding opportunities, publications, uh, program descriptions, initiatives, everything's available on BJ's main website at bj.ojp.gov. And then lastly, if you do have additional questions, that uh, was mentioned a little earlier in the presentation, uh, the OJP Response Center is going to be a wonderful resource for you. You can email them at grants at ncgrs.gov. They have web chat functionality available that you can access, a toll free number, 800. 851-3420 for questions, a TY option for the hearing impaired, 301-240-6310. They do staff the response center from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern time, Monday through Friday. So any specific questions regarding the solicitations that are out, you can contact them directly. So with that, we're at the end of today's program. Um, we'll go ahead and open it back up to questions uh, that have come in. Um, we can go ahead and just kind of get back to where we left off with the Just Grants questions, if that'll be okay, uh, Lisa. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, so Lenora, where were we with the Just Grants question? Yes. So I'm having, okay. If I'm having trouble accepting my award in Just Grants, should I contact the program officer listed under the grant award in Just Grants? Um, if you're having trouble accepting your award, I think the first stop would be to just grant technical support because there there might be a number of different um, different uh, things happening, so they can probably sort it out more uh, efficiently. So uh, technical support is on on the slide deck. Okay. Our next question in reference when you talked about the two deadlines. So the question was asked: two deadlines for the same grant. Yes, because we have a two-step process for um, for submitting an application. Um, the first step is submitting the piece that is required for grants.gov. They have one deadline. Um, then that application flows into Just Grants to be completed, and there's a second deadline in Just Grants. So if you miss the first deadline, then the second deadline doesn't um, doesn't isn't going to be helpful. Um, but yes, you have a grants.gov deadline and a just grants deadline, and both of those are on the front page of the solicitation. What does the narrative sections go? How soon can we get access to those if there are only two weeks between the two deadlines? Well, you know, the, as soon as the solicitation opens, you can begin working on both. Uh, you don't have to wait until the deadline to, um, to submit your application in grants.gov. In fact, we encourage you you know, as much as possible to go ahead and submit in grants.gov so that you have longer time to, um, you know, to, uh, you know, apply through just grants. So the narrative sections um, are determined really by the solicitation that you're answering. Um, so they, it, that, that the answer to that question will vary based on your solicitation. Um, but as soon as that solicitation is open, you are um, more than um, welcome to submit your grants.gov piece. And again, even if you have preliminary information, you can update it in uh, Just Grants, you know, as you move forward. So give yourself plenty of time. 
Thus, the Just Grants solicitation shows the Grants.gov deadline as well as the Just Grants deadline. So the solicitation is actually not a Just Grants thing. It's a DOJ, uh, it's a DOJ document. So the solicitation will show both Grants.gov deadline and the Just Grants deadline, yes. Here's the unit priority given to the entities who have certified and audited practices in place over an entity who follows best practices but is unaudited certified. If priority is given, is there any guidance in selecting an auditing agency? So I think that might be a question more for Greg or Elizabeth. Okay. Yeah, can, can you rephrase the question? I'm sorry. Yes. Is there any priority given to entities who have certified and audited practice in place over an entity who follows best practices, but is unaudited or certified? If priority is given, is there any uh, guidance in selecting an auditing agency? Okay, so for our, for BJA, our uh, awards or solicitations, we have specific priority considerations um, and that wouldn't be one that's indicated um, within um, our current solicitation. But each individual solicitation may have listed priority considerations based off that program, um, but that wouldn't be one that would be listed, uh, from my knowledge, as um, that would be a priority consideration. Okay. Thank you, Greg. You're welcome. Lisa, can more than one person be assigned to a single role? Absolutely. Um, a person can be assigned as many roles as they need. If they're going to be both uh, you know, managing the financial, federal financial reports and the performance reports, then they should be both a financial manager and a grant award administrator. And it's possible, too, that they might be a financial manager on one award and a um, grant award administrator on another. But, yeah, they can be assigned as many roles as needed. Okay, at least so early it sounded like that you said one needed to submit the forms in grants.gov before one can access the application materials. How much lead time does one have to access the grants package before the submission date? So as soon as the solicitation is published um, in grants.gov, then you can begin. Um, so, um, you know, you do need to submit the forms in grants.gov. The solicitation, um, again, is published in grants.gov. And as soon as you um, are ready, um, you can go ahead and submit your information from grants.gov. And again, another, um, after a day or two, then it will appear in Just Grants. So um, our recommendation is not to wait till a deadline to do that submission. Submit as early as is feasible for you. And again, if you don't have, if you have preliminary information to enter into grants.gov, you can always update it um, in Just Grants, prior to the Just Grants deadline. So our next question, Lisa, we might need a little bit more information. So I think this means that the budget will have to be the very first thing we do, correct? Because that goes into the SF 424 first. Um, actually, I believe the budget is not entered in the SF 424 aside from, you know, again, preliminary figures. So, um, again, if you, if you have sort of a general idea of the, of the um, budget totals that you're looking for and the project totals, you can enter those into just grants, or sorry, grants.gov, um, submit that application, and then you will enter the line items um, and the, the final budget will be entered in just grants. Why do prior submitted grants that were submitted prior to the due date show they are past due on applications page in just grants? Uh, so that's just the, that's a, a, a display, and it's been confusing to a lot of people. Um, what it means is the due date is passed, not that your application is overdue. So that's that's all it means is that the, the solicitation is closed. If the organization and the, and the, uh, okay, go ahead. Um, it just means that it just means that the just grants due date is passed. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So our next question: If an organization needs directions on sounds.gov, grants.gov, and just grants, what should be the order the first uh, time grant application? So the first thing you need to do is have a sam.gov um, uh, uh, account. 
Once you have the SAM.gov account, when you log into grants.gov, you're going to access that SAM.gov account to provide information in your application. And then um, grants.gov is where you start the application process. And so then the grants.gov information with the SAM.gov flows into just grants. So it's SAM just like the order you have it there, SAM.gov, grants.gov, and just grants. If I'm assigned to multiple roles, will I have different login information by role, or will I be able to log in to perform duties of the multiple roles in a single login? Oh, the beauty of Just Grants is that you only need to log, you need to have one login to one Just Grants account, and you can be assigned multiple roles on that login. I understand that in GMS, that was not the case. You had to log in separately depending on the role you were using. But no, it, for each individual Just Grants account, um, you will only have to log in one time and you'll be assigned all the roles on that single login. On the budget, is the Just Grants platform always going to be formatted to align with the e-project period, for example, six months planning and a year implementation? So um, that one, I'm not sure that's a Just Grants question. I believe that might be more of a program question. Okay. Yeah, that's great. I'm sorry. Can, can you repeat that question? Yes. On the budget, is the Just Grants platform always going to be formatted to align with the e-project period? For example, six months planning and a year implementation. Yes. Yes. Okay. All right, that was a short and sweet. <laughs> <laughs> So our next question, so the budget worksheet for uh, grants.gov does not automatically merge your budget information in just grants. Is that correct? Um, so the, the, the basic totals from grants.gov, I believe, come over into just grants, um, but the primary entry of the individual line items happens in just grants. Is the online budget form available for an existing grant budget GAM? For a grant budget GAM, so a grant, a grant award modification, um, that would be for a funded award. Um, so I'm not. Yeah, the GAM would yeah, be. Yeah, I'm not sure are, about the answer to that. Yeah, if you're already an awardee, you, get that, you would be working towards uh, working with your program, uh, your grant manager in terms of doing a GAM if you were doing any modifications to your, your award. Uh, yeah, I'm kind of confused on the question. Yeah, okay. yeah. Okay, so Tom, will you clarify the question for us uh, and post it back in the Q&A? Our next question, has Just Grants fixed the issue where not all attachments were able, were able to be seen after they were attached? There were several times last year where we were checking an application and didn't see an attachment. So we attached it again, even though it had already been attached. So we did have a couple of issues last year with attachments that had been resolved for our by our development team, um, but we still have we still have problems with people calling in saying they can't find their attachments, and the the primary culprit um, there is that when the attachment was uploaded, um, that the proper file category was not selected. So again, those file categories are so important for you to be able to place those um, attachments in your application where you want it. Is it possible to bypass the web-based BDW and just upload the Excel BDW, completing the web-based form is often time consuming? Uh, no, if the, if the web-based um, budget detail worksheet is, um, is exposed in Just Grants, that means that that is what you need to use. And the reason for that is because the budget figures that you enter in your application become your budget if, this, if your application is funded. So um, it allows, um, you know, it allows Just Grants to do, you know, more efficient um, calculations on your budget, um, on your budget figures, um, you know, throughout the life of the award. So um, it, it Just Grants can't do that with uh, an Excel spreadsheet. So yes, if you see a budget detail worksheet in, in uh, Just Grants, you must use that. So Lisa, our next one, uh, can you provide access or location of how to demonstrate uh, how to add multiple years on the BDW? 
so I, I don't have access to a demo um, currently for this, but um, I would uh, um, direct you um, to the resources um, website, uh, justicegrants.usdoj.gov, and um, we should have uh, something on that website that will help you. Um, if not, um, if not, then I would um, perhaps you could contact um, you know, our, our support desk and, and um, they can uh, help you with that as well. Or you can send me an email. I'll, I'll send you um, the uh, Just Grants um, training support uh, uh, email address and you can send it there. For clarification, can the, can the grant has been applied or be sealed out without a sign and authorized representative? I ask because our organization has its own approval process and we'll want to see the filled the field out grant application before approving it. Um, be filled out without, yeah, you can. And you, it, you must assign an authorized representative to submit it. But if you're going to, you know, if you're going to um, go through an internal approval process on the, you know, on the application prior to submitting, you don't need to fill out that authorized representative field until you're ready to submit. But you must have determined somebody. Um, in the application prior to submitting. And again, if you determine someone during the application submission process and that changes by the time the award is, um, you know, is the, the, the award is funded, then you could make that change um, when accepting the award, uh, should it be offered. Does the authorized representative need a unique password or can the password be shared with the entity administrator? So each individual person must have their own unique password. That individual person can both be the entity administrator and the authorized representative, but if it's two individuals, you have to have your own separate passwords. And the reason for that is because with the multi-factor authentication, you're gonna to have to determine you know, one um, email address or text message or um, voicemail that the, um, the login code is gonna to go to. So um, it's, no longer, it's no longer really feasible to have two people use the same um, username and password. Is the authorized representative in grants.gov the same person as the authorized representative in just grants.gov? Um, not necessarily. I mean, you can have an AOR in grants.gov, um, but that is not that, you know, if the person is assigned to AOR in grants.gov, that does not come over into just grants. Uh, the authorized representative must be assigned separately in just grants. So it can be the same person or not. If the SAM registration is expired, is it necessary to find all information and renew it, or is it acceptable to start the process over entirely? Does it matter? It does matter. Um, you need to find that old information because um, the unique identifier from SAM.gov is currently is the DUNS number, and your Just Grants account is going to be uh, based on that DUNS number. Uh, moving forward, uh, SAM, SAM.gov will have a uh, unique Entity identifier UEI, and your Just Grants account is going to be uh, connected to that UEI. So you must um, you must use the uh, original SAM registration. Our next question: The answer has been posted in the chat. Are we going to get an email with these slides? The answer has been posted in the chat. Mm -hmm. Are there any tips or tricks to the naming convention for attacking and Just Grants? I ran into some problems this last year where the system would not accept the title listed in the solicitation. There are no naming conventions that Just Grants is looking for. The only, um, the only I think, limitation is that the file name can't be more than 59 characters. Um, other than that, you can, you know, you can call it what you like. Um, Just Grants will only have a trouble if you try to upload the same file name more than once. It won't allow you to do that. So if you you know, uploaded a file and then you need to upload another one, um, you need to somehow or another change the name slightly or it won't, it won't allow it. Next question, ask to repeat the site. Okay, thank you, you answered that one. <laughs> <laughs> Are there specific training that I require based on the role? I think you answered that one. Um, yeah, the, um, the, uh, Federal finance, the financial manager and the grant award administrator must take an OCFO training. That's not a just grants training. Um, there are no required just grants training, only highly encouraged just grants training. And grants.gov, there are different 424 forms listed. 
which referred to as family? How do you know which uh, to select? Mm, that's, I think, might be a program question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is great. So when you're in grant.gov, I believe, I'm, I, you know, when you're in grant.gov, um, when you click on whatever solicitation you're looking for, um, I think it pulls, I believe it pulls up all the, the, the documents that's uh, associated with that, um, solicit, that solicitation, um, which should include also the SF-424. Okay. All right, thank you. So I have noticed when errors are in just grants showing certified and submitting if the budget fed amount doesn't match, there will be a pink ribbon until the budget is corrected or and or missing attachments are included in which I have experienced. I found this is a good way to be assured and balanced and all documents are submitted. Can you speak on this? Yeah, absolutely. Before, when you click that submit button, Just Grants is going to is going to validate your entries. So, uh, for instance, if if your um, total project cost is not equal to the federal amount and plus the um, match and you know all of the the different um, you know subtotals that you need, if that's out of balance, then there's no way to submit it because um, you know there there's there's no a cohesion in that in those budget figures. So yeah, it is a good way to make sure that you're in balance. Um, and typically in the pink banner, you're going to, if you read through the errors, it will, you know, and you have to kind of sometimes parse it a little bit, but it will tell you exactly what the problem is. And then you have to go back to that section and fix it. Um, and again, yeah, if there's a required uh, document that hasn't been uploaded, it will definitely tell you that, that this, if we're missing the proposal narrative, whatever it is. And uh, then you have to go back and upload it. So yeah, it will not allow you to submit without everything um, being uh, in order. So if we all are employed by our need of county government, then it sounds like we would use that number. I work for mental health department within our need of county government. Is that correct? So, yeah, well, so I think that's, that's really more of a question that you should maybe um, discuss internally because um, there may be multiple DUNS numbers for a need of county government and uh, perhaps depending on the doing business as portion of that, it might be a need of county government doing business as the mental health department. So the mental health department might be eligible for, you know, for different types of funding than a need of county government, um, you know, some other, you know, organization. So really, I think that's more of a discussion for you to hold internally to determine, you know, what, um, what funding will, will work for your groups. If an application gets denied, Will the applicant or organization be notified with their shortcomings were also, will they get another opportunity to reapply? Yeah, this so, is Greg, great. I'm going to so, throw that one to you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if they do apply, what we normally do, we send out award notices as well as those um, notices for those that uh, weren't awarded. Also, we uh, provide information that indicates what your strengths and weaknesses are. Uh, based off the peer review um, process. So that information does go out um, to those who uh, both uh, those who uh, applied but didn't get awarded. Uh, you, would, you would receive that information, yes. Okay. So we are currently sub recipients on BGA awards. Are we able to attend the trainings you last spoke about? For example, those occurring on February uh, 2nd, 9th, and et cetera for each category. Absolutely, the more the merrier. We'd love to have you. And Sam, there's a requirement for a specific type of communications requirement for communication between government entities and organizations. Please give insight. Um, I'm sorry, I can't speak to SAM.gov. That's a, that's a uh, program that is, um, is operated by a different federal agency. So it's just a program that we all access, but that's not something I can speak to, I'm afraid. Hey, Lisa, thank you so much. Um, we are nearing the end of the program today. Um, we're at 2.30 p.m. Eastern, so I wanted to thank all our presenters today uh, for wonderful information and insights. Thanks to the audience for a very in-depth questions. Hope you were able to, to hear the answers. Just want to note, too, if you want to stay connected, these links here, um, you can go ahead and access. 
And to re remind everybody, there's been a few questions about the recording. So yes, the recording, the PowerPoint, and the transcript for today will all be posted to the BGA website within approximately 10 days. So uh, you'll definitely want to keep on the lookout there and visit bga.ojp.gov for that because um, there's a lot to reference um, in, in today. So uh, we want to again thank you. And on behalf of the Bureau of Justice Assistance and our panelists, thank you for joining today's webinar This will end today's presentation.